Uh, I want to welcome you all to the uh, Making Sense of the Markets webinar uh, on uh, rates, Russia, and inflation. I want to thank you all for joining us on uh, a, a busy day, I'm sure. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, especially all the business that, that all of you have done with us for all our clients out there. Uh, my name is Joe Labresh from our Solutions Group at Natixis here. We're, I'm, I'm happy to be joined by Jack Janisiewicz and, and Garrett Melson, two folks that you've heard from quite a bit on these calls in the past. Uh, they're both portfolio strategists from the Natixis Investment Manager Solutions Group. Uh, they'll walk through a variety of timely issues uh, with some slides to accompany their, their, their comments. And uh, the goal here today is really to just provide some timely insights and ideas that really you can use in your business going forward. So before we get into the first question and, and into our slides and content, I just wanted to cover the agenda briefly. Um, as I said, this webinar was planned coming off the Fed meeting, but it's also an opportunity to talk about the latest news on the war in Ukraine and outlook for issues like inflation, the dollar and ideas we have across equity markets. So first we'll hit on the Fed decision and outlook. Uh, what did yesterday's decision mean for future rate policy? Uh, what are we likely to see from, for rate moves from here? Then we'll get, I, I would argue, to the biggest story, which is the war in Ukraine, uh, the potential outcomes we, we could see from here, whether a compromise will be reached, uh, and then what are the possible scenarios that result. Then we'll talk about, uh, I think, what is the biggest buzzword of the last six months, and that's inflation, uh, especially now with energy prices higher and the effect that, have, that could have on the economy. Uh, we're hearing a bit more about stagflation, which is hard to, to believe, so we'll, uh, we'll hit on that as well. That'll lead us into talk about uh, general recession. That's getting far more attention. We'll hit on both the corporate balance sheet side. Jack will talk a bit about that. And then Garrett will talk about consumer condi conditions, which are actually in pretty good shape. Uh, then Jack will talk a bit about the US dollar. There's talk about it losing its reserve status, which is hard to believe across the globe. Uh, recent moves which suggest that's really not gonna happen. So we'll hit on that uh, as well. And then uh, from there, we'll talk about the key data points that these two guys are watching uh, as we move forward. And uh, Garrett will hit on key areas they're looking at as to where markets could go from here. And then the last piece, I'd encourage you all to stay. We wanna make sure we hit on ideas, uh, you know, US versus international, looking at emerging markets and maybe different opportunity sets there. Anyway, uh, we'll get right into the content from here. So uh, Jack is gonna pull up our slides here and we're first gonna go to Garrett and talk a bit about the Fed decision. Uh, that happened yesterday. Uh, Garrett, as, as we all expected, uh, 25 basis points uh, was pretty well telegraphed by Powell and the Fed. Um, like we've seen in other times leading into a, a hiking cycle, though, there's been plenty of volatility ahead of this move. It went exactly as we expected. Um, but what's your reaction to this news and what Powell covered in the press conference that followed? And are we still looking at six more hikes for the rest of the year? And then what's it look like beyond that? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's always funny to see what the market reaction coming off these meetings are. And uh, honestly, if you look at the tape from yesterday, you probably have two conclusions. One, you know, the the, the actual rate hike itself and, and that statement uh, or summary of economic projections, maybe leaning a little bit hawkish, triggering a knee-jerk sell-off. And then whatever Powell said must have juiced the markets because he got a nice rally into the, the close. You know, I tend to think that you know, the reactions to these types of events are more a reflection of sentiment and positioning coming in. And sentiment was completely in the in the basement, uh, very, very leaning bearish across investor bases, investors generally under risk. And so it doesn't take much to get a little bit of a rally. You put that together with what we saw in terms of uh, positive headlines out of Russia and Ukraine, uh, some encouraging news from the state council in China. Uh, not surprising, we got a, quite a bit of a rally here. But you know, looking at the dot plot, you know, we got a certainly, um, you know, a, a, a solid move up. Um, and when you take a look what happened, really a lot of that was just simply pulling forward hikes into 2022. So not a whole lot in terms of incremental hikes further out uh, in terms of 23 and 24. So, you know, just to recap what we got, we got that first hike, 25 basis points as expected. Uh, Powell stated and reiterated that every meeting is live. Um, even a 50 basis point hike, which isn't necessarily the base case, but could be on the table if conditions warrant it. I think the one interesting thing that was missing was really some clarity on the balance sheet reduction. But we got a little bit of uh, an insight into that 
uh, this line that essentially balance sheet runoff will look very familiar. So take that as code to think that it's not going to entail outright sales. It's simply going to be allowing maturities to roll off and probably a cap to the rate at which that happens. So nothing really a, a whole lot shocking incremental. But I think the key takeaway other than the, the dot plot is taking a look at what we saw in terms of those economic projections. You can see that in the bottom right hand of this slide. Uh, and we saw some pretty meaningful upward revisions to inflation by year end and out into 23 and 24, and some meaningful downgrades to the growth backdrop. And I think that caught a lot of investors off guard here. But, you know, when we really kind of step back and think about the impact here, the bottom line is the markets like to look at the dot pot kind of as gospel and think that that's exactly how policy is going to play out moving forward. And that's simply not the case. We've heard that time and time again. There's a lot of uncertainty. If you just look at the dots on this, you can see the massive amount of dispersion, and that's grown over the last couple of meetings here. Uh, it's not policy set on a pre a predetermined path. They're not on autopilot. They're going to be data dependent. There are some growing risks if we jump to the next page, actually, uh, to some of those uh, estimates. And what you're looking at here, all of those participants on the FOMC meeting will give their uh, statement and views of risks to each of these forecasts. So uh, how to read this chart is simply, the higher these lines move, the more participants are viewing risks to the upside. So in this case, inflation risks obviously skewed to the upside. But if you flip that around, growth risks are probably skewed to the downside. And unemployment moving higher actually means a higher unemployment rate. And that means some risks to the labor market. So bottom line here, there's still a lot of uncertainty out there. You can see that reflected in the dispersion in the dots. And I think anybody reading into this saying that policies on a preset path uh, that's too simplistic. They're stressing optionality, they're stressing flexibility. They're going to be data dependent. If they have to move quicker because the data tells them to, they will. And if not, they probably will move a little bit slower and let the economy uh, work out a lot of these issues. Uh, at the end of the day, I think talk is cheap. He can sound hawkish. That will do a lot of the dirty work. The market will do with his bidding for him. And you might actually end up seeing that the Fed doesn't hike quite as aggressively as even their own dots suggest. That's great, Gary. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of talk about job owning in our offices, and Powell has sort of successfully done that. And uh, we certainly didn't see the 50 basis points that a lot of the Hawks were calling for. It, it kind of went exactly as as Powell said it would, frankly. And so um, not, a, not a huge surprise to us and, and not a huge surprise to the markets. So we'll move on to uh, the second topic, and I would argue probably the biggest topic for when this call is happening and what's going on in the world. Um, and that's the war in Ukraine. Uh, so this has become kind of the primary story, I'd argue, uh, seemingly the primary force that's driving markets in the shorter term, especially up until uh, the last couple of days. It's now affecting many areas of the market, you know, risk assets overseas, especially commodity markets, including oil is the big one. Um, you know, Jack, I think you have a, a slide here on some potential outcomes of, of the war and um, what you think will happen as a result, if you want to pull that up. Yeah, I, I think, Jill, the, what matters most for this sort of idea is simply not, you know, the day-to-day -day thing, but it's how might we see an end when we start talking about the end of this conflict, it's really the negotiation process that we're referring to. And so I put together this uh, uh, this flow chart trying to uh, basically uh, outline some of the things that we're thinking about, some of the things that we've, we're hearing about and try to give us a sense in terms of how realistic these things could be. And there's a couple of easy things that I think that can get done from negotiations and a couple of challenging ones here. Um, it, it, we are seeing a little bit of an overtone shift, I think, from uh, from Putin. It sounds like they're at least trying to come to the table. You know, he's got four things that we think were on the table in terms of trying to get the negotiations moving forward, right? The first one, Ukraine to remain neutral, so no NATO status, no accession into the EU. Uh, the second one, really a disarmament of Ukraine. Um, never being able to hold uh, or acquire offensive weapons. We're hearing a little bit of potential negotiations on the back of this, where maybe it's also allowing them at the interim to uh, take on some of the defensive capacities there. So a little bit of a shift in tone there. Also in the Donbass region, really recognizing those two breakaways, but uh, we've also heard the potential for a referendum being held and let them vote on it, so to speak. The issue there would also be, you know, will that be a clean and fair election? And then the fourth one was regime change, but I think we can kind of cross off regime change at this point. That's a non-starter. So you've got these three things that have been up for grabs. You know, the first one, the uh, the NATO accession and EU accession. I think that most, I think the uh, the most of the people are going to be okay with that, simply because from a NATO perspective, 
uh, that probably means less confrontation with Russia. So for them to sort of take that off the table, that's probably a step in the right direction for the broader perspective. But the other thing to think about here that's also interesting, these negotiations are not simply happening between Russia and Ukraine. You really have to think about this as negotiations between Russia and the West. And that, I think, is also another complicating factor because you have very different outcomes um, in terms of what some of these Western countries are, are looking for. So, for example, if you kind of go to the right here, you know, the U.S. probably would not, to want, not want to peel back a significant portion of the sanctions until Putin is actually removed from power. So that's going to make that leg of the, the, uh, the negotiation process a little bit interesting. You know, there's also a, a need for potentially keeping those sanctions on longer in order to prevent further aggressions and also to send a message to China and Xi regarding the potential for what they might do um, when you think out in terms of the Taiwan policy there. Um, the other thing to think about, too, is a lot of the European economies are very intertwined with Russia. And so they might be more in favor of pulling back those sanctions aggressively because they're starting to feel the pinch a little bit more difficult, if you will. And then the last one to think about the self-sanctioning that we've, saw, we've seen taking place. And, you know, that self-sanctioning, I think, is going to be interesting because it might take some time for a lot of those companies to return to normalcy in Russia. So end of the day here, you know, we certainly are seeing progress moving in the right direction. Um, the one thing that I would note, though, you know, is this also simply a stall tactic in the interim, right? As we sort of hear about these peace negotiations, uh, it certainly seems like Russia is still going on full force with their military onslaught. And is this just a simply a means to drag their feet and continue on with the, uh, the military push? And that's the unfortunate side effect to all this. So a couple of things to think about in terms of how we're potentially seeing the, un the, uh, the end of this unfold, but it certainly seems like there's plenty to happen in the interim along the way here. Thanks, Jack. And uh, it seems like every day the news cycle gives us a different potential outcome. And, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more about a potential kind of ceasefire, but also uh, compromise between the two nations, which I think has been good for the markets overall the last few days. And I'm seeing in the Q&A box here that everyone's really impressed with the clip art that you used to put together that chart. So congrats on that. You have a future in that. Um, it's a college degree right there. Thanks, Boston University. There you go. There you go. A BU grad, nonetheless. Uh, so we'll move on and uh, we'll go to Garrett first on this. Uh, we can't have a macro webinar over the last six months, right, without talking about inflation. Uh, it's been the buzzword, only to be replaced by the war in Ukraine recently. Um, the Fed is seemingly in liftoff mode to combat inflation. That was a lot of what Powell talked about yesterday, or a bit of what he talked about. Uh, we have food and energy prices moving higher. It's been exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, Garrett. Um, what's the current outlook on inflation? What are the risks of stagflation? I mentioned that in the agenda. Um, something that some are mentioning now that's probably a bit unrealistic, we'd say. Uh, what's the real impact of rising oil prices and of rising food prices going forward? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, we continue to have to talk about inflation. And to be honest, we're getting a little tired of that since that's the only topic we seem to have talked about over the last year and a half. But uh, nonetheless, you know, certainly our expectation coming into this year is that Q1 looked like the peak. Uh, this does absolutely throw a, a bit of a wrench in the in the story here. And as you mentioned, the real pass through from the conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine is coming through that pass through in food and energy prices. So if we pull up the, the next slide here, I think it's important to think about what is really driving the surge in energy prices that we've seen uh, really over the course of this year. And I think there's kind of some interesting regimes you can break it into. Um, on this slide, we're just looking at uh, w, uh, WCI spot crude price prices here. And we kind of labeled out these regimes for you. And if you think about where oil probably is fair valued uh, based off of some demand and supply backdrops, we know supply is constrained. It was constrained coming into this. You know, energy companies have found a new religion in kind of controlling the amount of volume and focusing on uh, return on equity here. And so 75, 85 range seems about fair, but you can see we start to drift higher through the early portion of January into that 85, 95 uh, area. And I think that's when you start to price in a little bit of that uncertainty regarding uh, just if a conflict is about to erupt. And obviously you can see as, that, as the invasion took place, we gapped higher into that 105, 115 range. And then about a week and a half ago uh, on that Sunday night, we saw actually touching to 131. And that's as really those sanctions were getting ratcheted up and I think that's an idea that we've kind of floated around that that could be actually your, your high watermark for, you know, peak sanction risk, because not only did you have the U.S. Uh, talking about full sanction and U.S., it's a little bit more symbolic than anything. We don't depend on uh, on Russian imports of oil that much. Uh, 
Uh, but you did start to hear some chatter of potential embargoes from Russia and uh, full sanction from the European Union, which is heavily dependent, as Jack mentioned, on the uh, on Russian exports here. We've obviously seen a significant unwind here over the last couple of days. A couple of reasons, you know, an off ramp potentially coming into view for the conflict. Uh, and also what you've seen in terms of the demand picture coming from China and some of those lockdowns. But the bottom line here is that we're probably still in an environment where part of that elevated energy price backdrop is because of that elevated geopolitical risk premium. There's still somewhat of a right tail of those prices. So, you know, we probably do see some of that premium come out if we get a positive, uh, you know, resolution here. But if we jump back to the next slide here, what happens if we don't see a resolution? What happens if energy prices and, and some of those food prices that come from Ukraine remain elevated, especially the wheat prices? Well, I think there's a couple things to keep in mind. One, if you think about energy intensity, that's just how much energy we consume to generate a given unit of GDP. You can look across the globe and you've seen energy intensity has fallen dramatically. Just think about the gains you've seen in fuel efficiency in, in your car and then extrapolate that across the entire economy. Huge gains since the 70s. It's not going to be like a, spy, uh, a price shock and supply shock like in the 70s. And even just going back five, 10 years, you've seen some pretty solid gains. But if we jump to the next slide, what's the byproduct of that? Well, you see that the energy spend is relative to uh, disposable income, especially for the U.S. consumers, fallen dramatically. And so you can see that on the light blue line here, uh, energy consumption relative to that disposable income still sitting pretty much close to all time lows, despite the gains we've seen in oil prices over the last year. So, you know, a price surge to over 100. Uh, even up to that 140 high watermark back in 2008 doesn't have the same incremental impact on demand destruction as what we've seen in prior years and prior shocks. And finally, if we think about that for the food front, it's the same concept, right? We've seen that uh, food consumption relative to incomes and relative to the consumption has fallen. So bottom line here is I think there's this notion to say that there's a real risk for stagflation because of the pass through of energy prices. That is a risk. But it's not to the same magnitudes as I think a lot of investors think, looking back to some of those comps back in the 70s. And when you think about it, you know, the U.S. consumer has a bigger cushion. We have some savings built up on balance sheets. U uh, European consumers do as well. But if you're looking for a risk of stagflation, it's not here. It's probably over in the eurozone. And even that, if we see those energy prices fall further, is probably an overstated risk. Yeah, so not to be insensitive because there's sticker shock that come with higher gas prices, but you know, you, you can go a lot further in your car on that tank of gas than you could even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And uh, you know, despite that, that the fact that there's been a lot more interest in buying of electrics and hybrids, a lot of the gas cars we use today are just using less gas and that, that has a big effect on this for our economy. So let's move into the next topic, inflation into the risk of recession. So we're gonna go a bit uh, into this on the corporate side first, Jack is going to talk a bit about uh, whether corporate balance sheets and corporate health is there to uh, potentially fight off this risk of recession overall. Yeah, and I think you're going to hear the uh, the the resounding theme on both the, the household balance sheet side as well as the corporate balance sheet side, and that both have really never been better. And I think that's something that's getting lost in a lot of these headlines. You know, we've got that postpartum syndrome. Uh, where we always harken back to the 0708 crisis, we call it 2008 itis. Um, you know, those things are still fresh in our minds because of the battle wounds that we suffered in the backdrop to that. But you know, a lot's changed since that 2007-2008 uh, backdrop, and quite frankly, a lot changed in the midst of the COVID crisis. Right? Sort of think about um, what corporate America did as we started to go into the depths of COVID, and what the Fed ended up doing. Right? Between backstopping the markets. Uh, providing all the uh, lifelines of liquidity, if you will, kept the credit markets open so all these companies could issue. Um, it's pretty amazing when you start to look at the overall balance sheet for a lot of these companies that, quite frankly, it, it's rock solid in here. So a couple of things I think worth pointing to with this, uh, you know, it's one, it's the maturity profile of the market, right? And we, we spend a lot of time focusing on high yield and the loan market because that's at the tip of the credit spectrum from a risk appetite perspective, right? So that's going to be the first one to sort of crack. And just to think about it, it comes down to the ability to service that debt and problems start to run in when you have that. It's when you have the, a huge bunch of maturities coming due. And if you look at the maturity profile for the leveraged loan space, for example, this year, you're talking about almost 13 uh, one tenth of one percent of the total loan market coming due this year, less than one percent of the high yield market coming due. Go out to 2023, 
about 3% of the high yield market coming due and 2.5% of the loan market coming due. The point being, there's not a lot of bond issuance or I'm sorry, bond maturities coming that are going to have to be repaid. That's where you start to run into issues on the credit market side. So you know, the wall of maturities, if you will, has been extended out. But even more importantly, if we look at sort of the ability to repay those obligations right now in this first chart here, um, we're simply looking at interest coverage ratio for high yield because of all that basically backstopping of the market, being able to issue all these companies issued debt, put all this extra cash on their balance sheets. Think about it from that perspective, the ability for them to basically make their interest payments. You can see here, it's basically never been higher. So again, what's coming due, it's gonna be those coupon payments, the ability for a lot of corporate America and specifically on the high yield side to make those payments, extremely strong, right? You also think about what we've seen from a debt profile perspective, right? Total debt actually started to increase into the heart of COVID. Once we came through COVID though, what do we see? We started to see a deleveraging. Companies were actually paying down that debt and actually deleveraging their balance sheets. So very, very strong. And the last thing to think about, right? Profitability has gone through the roof. We've seen that all of last year. If you just look at on the equity side, right? Earnings per share growth has never been higher basically. What happens Well, you have all these companies making money hand over fist from a revenue standpoint, that's falling right to their bottom line. Again, what you're seeing, cash being amassed. And when you look at the total corporate sector here, and this comes right from uh, the Fed database, you're just simply looking at non-financial corporate businesses. And I'm just pulling, in this case, cash and short-term cash equivalents. You're sitting north of $7 trillion. So the bottom line here, when you think about the potential for some sort of uh, clogs, if you will, in the financial credit system. Um, the corporate America is sitting on a ton of cash. No bonds coming due. No debt maturities coming due that are, are that are chunky. And as a result, I think the idea that you could see corporates running into some trouble, at least in the interim, should the economy slow. You know, listen. I think at the end of the day, corporate America has really never been better. That balance sheet's stronger than ever. And it's very difficult, I think, to make bets against corporate America at this point right now. So. From a credit standpoint, corporate balance sheet really never been better. It's all a function of uh, that cash on that balance sheet, which has never been uh, never been stronger. That's great. Thanks, Jack. Let's hit the other side of the equation, and that's the consumer, Garrett. Um, Seventy percent of the U.S. economy, by most estimates, right? We know the demand side has been really strong through COVID, especially for goods. We're expecting that to shift more to services over time. Um, can they take a hit here from rising prices? What's the risk that it spills over into other parts of the market? And, you know, to the previous comment, I think the, the, the U.S. consumer is in better shape than ever, right? And we don't have that 2008 scenario where the, many of them are strapped with debt. Is this true? What's your outlook overall for kind of the U.S. consumer as it relates to recession risk? Yeah, you know, I think you hit the key points right there. The, the consumer really is the, the driver of the U.S. economy. And, you know, kind of following on the back of Jack's comments, Corporate America has never been stronger and households have never really been in a stronger position uh, at the aggregate level either. If you just take a look at household debt to disposable income, that idea of deleveraging, you've seen that play out over the course of uh, the, the pandemic, which is really stunning that through a massive recession, you actually saw leverage falling dramatically. And it wasn't really because consumers were battening down the hatches. You recovered back to consumption, back to pre-crisis trends very rapidly and that's really a reflection of the fact that you know the the fiscal and, and monetary response got the really desired results which is a quick uh v-shaped recovery here so when you take a look at the the balance sheets moving forward well we're very much in a different position from where we were post uh, financial crisis where we were in a period of a sustained balance sheet repair you look at the balance sheet now and it's a source of strength moving forward so you know potential downside risks that demand destruction scenario to the extent we see any of that there's definitely significant cushion uh to soften that blow and you know you, you expand that out a little bit further than just uh, debt to disposable income, but you start looking at those excess savings. We've talked a lot about that here in the U.S. It's about 10.5% of GDP that's built up as excess savings above what we uh, would have expected based off that pre-crisis trend. So a lot of room to buffer uh, potential downside shocks, but also a lot of room to continue powering consumption moving forward. And on top of that, if you actually think about where uh, uh, organic wage growth is coming from, you know, that's certainly been a little bit of a concern for that wage price spiral. We don't see any evidence of that. But on the contrary, what does that mean? That means that incomes are still coming in strong. 
Uh, and what does that mean for the consumption story? It tracks pretty much one for one. Uh, historically, if you look at aggregate income growth across the entire economy here, that's what you see on this next slide. Uh, so think of that as just the number of people employed by the hours they worked, by the hour, uh, the, um, the amount of money they're making per hour. That gives you a sense of that growth of incomes and it tracks pretty much one for one with nominal PCE. So you look out to the future here and there's a lot of room to, to buffer some downside shocks to growth here. Uh, and that really sets the stage for a very compelling growth backdrop moving forward. That's great, Garrett. You can see on that prior slide, you can see that peak in 2008 of, of debt to household. And um, clearly we've fallen off a cliff there over the last, what, 14 years now? So 14 plus years. So certainly the, the risk of that uh, seems lower and um, the consumer is in much better shape. So uh, before we, we shift gears a bit to the U.S. dollar, which Jack will talk about, Garrett, can you just, it sounds like you're saying risk of recession is low, um, but how do you see all these factors coming together for the path of the Fed going forward? Are they likely to stay on this inflation narrative and use rate hikes given the strength of the economy? Um, you mentioned balance sheet reduction. Are there other concerns given the geopolitical landscape? Um, recognizing, of course, that Powell kind of opened his press conference yesterday talking a bit about these outside factors. Yeah, you know, I think the the thing I like to push back the most against is this idea that the Fed is tightening into a slowdown. And so if you kind of go back to the slides we just walked through, you know, corporate America and households really being a strong catalyst for growth. But I think you can expand that list even further when you start to think of some of those other drivers of growth. You know, just looking at where we are coming out in, in what we'd still consider fairly early stages of the recovery, maybe we're starting to move into mid-cycle, but we still haven't gotten that inventory restocking cycle you normally see in an early stage of recovery. Part of that's because demand is so strong. Part of that's the supply bottlenecks we know about. But that's a big driver and, and boost and tailwind to growth. On top of that, we're seeing really signs of an emerging CapEx cycle that we haven't gotten in probably over a decade. Uh, another big tailwind for growth. And then the last two to think about, you know, state and local budgets uh, at government levels, very, very strong. They've seen surpluses uh, that they're looking to, to deploy. And the last one we always like to talk about, the consumer might be the driver of growth, but housing is really the economy. I know there's a lot of fears around rising rates choking that off, but we're starting to get some data in that it's more resilient to those higher mortgage rates we've seen over the last month. And the bottom line is even if we see some of that demand trim a little, we're still in a structural uh, net deficit for housing in this country. And we're moving into that real peak of demand for millennials here. So really a strong backdrop. And there's a lot of homes that are on that new inventory list that haven't even been built. So more and more growth in the tailwind. So what does that mean for the Fed? Well, they're not tightening into a slowdown. It probably more looks like an inflationary boom, if anything. Um, and I think big, the big portion of the story, kind of what we kicked off the call with is that the Fed's not on autopilot, right? So we know there's some potential risks here. Growth should probably stay robust, but if there's some hiccups down the road, you know, we, we expect that they will adjust policy accordingly. And they've stressed exactly that. They're gonna be data dependent here. So for now, they're obviously leaning into that inflation narrative and job owning, as you said here. Uh, but I think what's interesting is you can almost kind of think of those revisions, those um, that summary of economic projections as almost a, an implicit a rise in that kind of target for inflation. It might not be 2% anymore for the next couple of years because they're allowing that to run a little bit hot. It's almost like they're revising that target a little bit higher here. Um, and I think that changes the narrative from something where they're gonna choke off growth to uh, stamp out inflation, kind of like that Volcker narrative. That's not what they're doing. They're tightening because growth in labor markets and inflation are high. So you should be tightening here. Um, but tightening to an extent that it's relatively slow and inflation still remains a little bit elevated here. So uh, I think there's too much growth out there from a multitude of sources, uh, and we're seeing tightening that's probably warranted for now into a very robust economy that can probably handle it. Uh, everything they keep saying, Garrett, continues to come true. They keep saying they'll be transparent. They keep saying they'll be data dependent. The market doesn't want to listen, and it keeps happening, right? And we keep yeah. saying it. So. It's definitely the case uh, uh, today and, and what, what happened yesterday. So we'll shift gears here for, for a second and talk about the dollar, uh, uh, a topic that Jack is very passionate about. Um, he's going to show a slide here on some, some stats on the U.S. dollar, and really it continuing to be the, the dominant currency worldwide. Um, Jack, is, is there a risk that the dollar loses its reserve status? I think we've seen, especially since the breakout of the war in Ukraine, that that's not the case. A lot of that is a reaction to the commodity markets. But can you talk a bit about the U.S. dollar and then uh, 
show the folks some of these uh, data points. Bottom line here, we've heard this thesis thrown out for forever, and it basically never ends up panning out. And there's a couple of things I think worth highlighting when we talk through this, because uh, the bottom line here, you know, the dollar is the dominant currency, and it's the dominant currency by far. It's not even close to being a having a, someone out breathing down its neck for a, the number two in terms of usage here. And a couple of couple of bullet points I wanted to run through that I pulled from both the Bank of International Settlements and the IMF. You know, when you think about how widespread the dollar is used, it's half of all cross-border loans and in, in international debts. That's the dollar. Eighty-five percent of all FX transactions are against the dollar. Remember, an FX transaction always has to have two sides. You're going to be buying one currency and selling another. 85% of those all entail the dollar, whether it be on the funding side or the long side. If you think about foreign official reserves, and that's what this pie chart is showing you here, the USD accounts for roughly 59% of official foreign currency reserves. And what I was saying earlier, the next one in line is the euro at 20. So there's almost a three to one advantage of the dollar over the euro. And the one that keeps coming up, and I'll get to this in a second, maybe we start to see CNY or RMB start to take a little bit of uh, that chunk. You know, right now that sits at 3%. Um, and then the last one here, the last two, I should say, international trade, more more than half of that is basically invoiced in dollars. And roughly 40% of all international payments are made in dollars. So the bottom line here, to dethrone the dollar, you're going to have to basically upend the entire global payment system. And while some of these numbers may seem, you know, 50, 40% might not seem very big, it is big. And think of all the contracts that are written with the dollar intact. So to basically change all of this, it's not going to happen in a month, a quarter, a year. This is a decade-long transition, and that's going to be, I think, very difficult. But if we think about this, there's a couple of things I sort of wanted to work through on the other side. Let's just play devil's advocate and say, okay, maybe the dollar will start to lose its reserve currency status. What would replace it, right? And the one that comes up quite a bit is the Chinese renminbi, CNY. But to think about it, right? If, if we start to move in that direction, you're effectively going to be abandoning both the euro and the dollar. And that, that pie chart I just showed you, that's almost 80% of the entire reserve currency backdrop. So you're basically replacing roughly what central banks on, on aggregate, 80% of all central banks are using. That's a big ask. Yeah, it makes some sense to throw CNY out there because China is about 18% of the global economy. About 15% of world exports come from China. So yes, the usage of CNY might be uh, starting to pick up a bit. But remember, CNY is not a fully convertible currency. Why does that matter? Well, if you think back to 2015, 2016, when China had that pretty significant drawdown in the equity markets, and you started to see capital flight coming out of China as a result of that, what did the Chinese do? They basically gated the currency, right? They put on capital controls. If you're talking about a reserve currency, do you want to have a potential risk of capital controls being thrown upon that? The bottom line for any sort of, I think, realistic move in terms of using CNY even more China's going to have to give up or relinquish control of CNY. It's a dirty float at this point. I don't think China's anywhere near getting ready to do that. And as a result, I don't think that's a legitimate response here in terms of replacing the dollar. I've heard some talk about gold being replaced, right? Bottom line there, gold is about 15% of global reserves. Problem there, though, is you need an electronic payment system. And how do you get an electronic payment system with gold? You're going to need the banks. Well, who regulates the banks? Governments. Who do banks report to? Governments. So at the end of the day, Who's sanctioning everybody? And that's sort of what's revisiting this idea of the uh, dollar losing its reserve currency status. It's governments that are laying the sanctions out. So from that standpoint, I'm not sure that's effective in terms of how people are thinking about this. And the last one that I hear that keeps coming up, it's Bitcoin, right? And, you know, from a, from a, from a Bitcoin transaction perspective, a lot of it occurs over the Internet. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Well, what happens when you go to war? And then again, this is sort of the backdrop we're hearing a lot of these uh, these, these ideas coming from. The internet goes out. So that becomes a very challenge in terms of transacting with Bitcoin. The other thing to think about, you know, I still can't go down the street and actually buy a Coke with my Bitcoin. So I'm going to actually use this as a global reserve currency. You know, listen, the system's not designed right now to handle large transactions and frequent transactions. It's just that can't support the global system right now. And lastly, think about it, right? Governments still have control over this, right? We can somehow sanction the systems that you trade on. Um, we've also seen the FBI has actually been able to tra uh, to track some of these uh, transactions that have occurred. That anonymity, I think, is still in question there. So the bottom line, you know, if we're going to start talking about the dollar losing its reserve currency, that yeah, makes for some good clicks, good headlines. But the practicality of that 
even if we start moving to marginal diversification out of the dollar into other currencies, makes some sense. This is a, this is going to be years and years and years in the making, not something that's going to happen over the next couple of quarters. We're talking decades. And the other thing to think about, too, from a global perspective, it's actually not a bad thing to have one dominant currency, because if you think about times of global financial stress, like COVID crisis, like the financial crisis, that lender of last resort, resort i.e. the Fed, that's a big deal. The Fed can step in and basically provide lines of liquidity to all these major central banks to make sure that there's enough U.S. dollars in the system. That's a big bonus, I think. And I think people are overlooking that backdrop as well. It makes sort of backstopping a lot of these financial crises very easy when you have a major central bank like the Fed standing and willing to provide liquidity. So the idea that the dollar is going to lose its reserve currency status makes for some good stories, makes for some good fear mongering. I just don't see the practicality of that. Not anytime soon, at least. That's great. Jack Janisiewicz, not a Bitcoin bug. There's gold bugs and there's Bitcoin bugs, not a Bitcoin bug. He's on record. Uh, and, and I think you've seen the last couple of days too, Jack, that, that China is trying to do everything it can to support growth, support the stock market, the real estate market, as it's really got beaten up the last few weeks. A lot of that's regulatory. And you know they're entering more of an easing cycle, which is never good for a currency. So the dollar continues to shine. And, and certainly, again, we've seen that since uh, the, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Uh, so let's move on to, to maybe some forward-looking items, guys. Uh, let's talk a bit about some of the key data points that you're both looking at moving forward. Um, we'll start with you, Garrett. Uh, you're going to talk a bit about kind of some of the consumption data that you're watching and, and uh, where you think it goes from here. Yeah, well, I mean, if we're going to say the consumer is 70% of the economy, that's probably what we should be keeping a close eye on. And there's a couple indicators that we've been watching recently. Um, you know, I, I think what's interesting over the COVID crisis is we found a whole lot of alternative data sources that are far more high frequency than kind of those traditional economic sources that we're all used to. Uh, one of them is that part, you know, credit card transaction data. And some of the big banks put this out. But the BEA actually has started to track some of these transactions as well. And, you know, I think this is kind of overlooked, but, you know, we just got through the, the Omicron uh, variant, you know, just uh, about a month and a half ago here, you know, still lingering here. But the bottom line is that real sustained reopen that everybody expected to happen last year pretty much got delayed because of Delta. And then it got delayed because of Omicron. You know, is there a risk for another variant? Sure. But the bottom line here is if you start looking at some of this transaction data, uh, take a look at some of these reopen sectors. So you look at spending at uh, accommodations, so hotels, uh, amusements, uh, recreation events, food services, and dining. Um, those are all starting to hook higher from levels that are still below zero, which means below kind of that baseline prior to the pandemic here. So there's certainly a lot of catch up just to get back to, say, a normal economy. But if you think about all that revenge spending that's pent up here, there's still a lot of people that have not gone on trips, not gone on vacations, not done a whole lot of service related activities that they wanted to over the past two years. You think that we're just gonna get back to baseline and stop there? I think there's probably some sustained uh, potential to the upside on that. And one way we can gauge that is actually taking a look at airline data. Uh, if you look at bookings from some of the airlines we heard this week, bookings are picking up. Uh, if you take a look at the number of flights they're picking up, and now on this chart, you're just taking a look at the number of passengers that are going through those TSA checkpoints. And each of these is just tracking uh, the actual volume on a daily basis relative to the same day back in 2019. And so essentially, this is just a percentage of 2019 volumes. No surprise that 2020 was very low. 21, we started making progress, but still, you know, finished the year around 80%. Right now, we're sitting at about 90%. So once again, getting back close to zero, but probably still a strong case to be made that we can overshoot here when you consider all the, the shifts in consumption that are likely to play out. You know, going back to the inflation story, it hasn't been a story of excess demand. It's been a story of that demand shifting towards goods where all those supply chain constraints have been. If you think we're going to start seeing that shift go back towards services, there's less supply constraints there, easier to handle a lot of that volume. And services are a big portion of our economy. That's a big portion of growth. Uh, so, you know, I think what we're probably going to see is a rotation under the service for consumption here. But those indicators continue to point to uh, consumers that might be complaining about inflation being high and complaining that it's not great. But at the end of the day, they're just kind of stomaching those higher prices and continuing to, to consume. And that's going to be good for growth. Yeah, I think our bet here is that it's been two years and there's plenty of folks that want to take a trip, travel again, and uh, higher prices there isn't necessarily going to stop them, right? So. 
we expect a big pickup in, in services and travel and those charts there sort of uh, exhibit that. So we'll, we'll switch gears here towards uh, Jack, towards the credit markets and maybe some things that you're looking at there that are leading indicators uh, for you. Yeah, and so just to piggyback, you know, obviously, Joe, you hit it on the head. The consumer is a big portion of uh, the U.S. growth backdrop. So we're going to pay attention to the real-time growth indicators and real-time consumption indicators that Garrett just walked through. And I think the other one that, that we pay attention to, it's uh, really what's, what, what the credit market is telling us, right? And um, I, I like to joke, I, I spent my uh, my early years in the credit market side of the of the world. I like to say the smart guys are in the credit markets and the more emotional guys are in the equity space. That's why we tend to look at what's going on in credit to confirm or deny what we're seeing as a result of the price action in the equity space. And so we're going to spend a lot of time watching what the credit markets are telling us, right? And I think that's going to be a key tell going forward in terms of how severe we might see from a, from a policy response impacting the economic backdrop and the potential for a slowdown, and then ultimately back to the stagflation argument that we were having earlier. But the point being, a couple of things to pay attention to here, and I'll highlight those. You know, first of all, Credit market to us is still fairly well behaved, right? When we look at where spreads are relative to the drawdown we saw in equities, you know, credit spreads have done actually fairly well. So a couple of things that we pay attention to, first one is going to be access to the market, right? Our credits, are our companies still able to come to the market and issue new debt? So far, we've seen a couple of deals pulled, but for by and large, some rather chunky deals have done, and that's a good sign. So the credit market, access to the market still alive and well. We're going to look at spread differentials. You know, you're going to look at triple Bs versus single Bs and see if that gap starts to widen out. If it widens, obviously, it's a sign of more concern in the marketplace. We'll also look at spreads between high yield and investment grades. So, again, just looking at that tiering, are we seeing it widening out? Because if we do see it widening out, obviously, again, markets starting to get concerned with the higher risk backdrop and high yield spreads, repricing that. And, but it's also, keep in mind, we should see some modest spread widening in here, too. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because as the Fed is starting to tighten, they want to see financial conditions tighten. And financial conditions, part of that is a function of credit spreads. So, yes, the Fed wants to see credit spreads widening out a little bit. So just because we're seeing some spread widening in here, that's exactly what we should expect, right? Because that's what the Fed is trying to do. They're tightening, they're trying to slow things down. And as a result, financial conditions should continue to tighten. It's just a question of how far do those spread widenings go, so to speak. So I think that the bigger issue, and I think that the telling issue is really what tends to lead a downturn in the credit cycle. And the big one to us, right, as credit investors, it's always going to be whether you're going to be at the end of the day repaid, right? That's the ultimate backdrop for us. And one of the things that we keep harping on, as long as the market still stays open, as long as you still have access to credit, and as long as banks are willing to provide that credit, that should continue to bo uh, boost the markets or at least provide a floor under the markets. It's when access to credit gets shut off that things start to turn south. And one of the big things that we pay attention to is what's called the Senior Loan Officer Survey. What is that? Well, it's one of the Fed's uh, big uh, surveys that they go out, they go out to the regional banks and they ask the regional banks to go out to their constituents at the banks, at, at, the, at the, uh, the, the, the smaller banks and ask, are you guys tightening lending standards or loosening lending standards, whether it be for small, medium or large size companies? And again, a function of access to credit, are banks willing to extend credit? Because listen, they're at the front line. So if banks are starting to see some deterioration, they're probably going to start to reel that back in a little bit, become more selective in terms of their lending backdrop. So they'll start to respond, yeah, we're tightening our lending standards. So what do you see here? This is the result of that senior loan officer survey, the light blue line. It's, that's just simply a diffusion index, right? It's the percentage of respondents saying that they're tightening standards relative to whether they're loosening them. So in this case here, anything that moves down more banks are coming back and saying, we're loosening standards relative to tightening. If we see that line moving higher, we're seeing more banks tightening as a percentage of those responding. So you can see the lead lag relationship here as access to credit and as banks start to tighten those uh, lending standards, you can see the default rate for high yield starts to lag by a couple of quarters in here. So the point being, this is a good pre-indicator of the market backdrop. If banks are starting to tightening up credit, banks are on the front line, they start to see those issues popping up, they start to pull back their risk appetites, so they're not going to lend as much. We'll probably start to see those uh, respondents saying, yes, we're tightening standards, and that should be a precursor to saying things are starting to get a little bit more concerning. What are we seeing? Well, again, that break-even line is at zero. 
had a little bit of an uptick in the more recent survey, but we're still well into that looser standards uh, category. So until we start to see banks really significantly tightening up those lending standards, it's going to be hard for us to really see a significant downturn within the credit markets. And we walked through that backdrop earlier, right, with all the cash on balance sheets. So for us, access to credit still seems to be open. Banks are still willing to lend. Corporate balance sheets have never been better. As a result, for us, sure, we should see some spread widening. But again, do we expect it to continue to blow out in here? One of the things we're going to be paying a lot of attention to is how banks are responding. And so far, we're continuing to see banks saying we're willing to lend. Good sign still. Yeah, one of the great signs of, of the last few weeks is that credit spreads have remained pretty pretty tame. And uh, as, as you said, Jack, the smart money is on the fixed income side and in the credit market. So no wonder that you started in the business on the credit side. Uh, out of BU, as you already said. So Didn't uh, last long there. How about that? <laughs> you went to the emotional side after that, as you said. <laughs> okay, uh, to to kind of uh, end things here, and before we get to Q and A, let's get to some investment implications. So we're going to go to Garrett first on this, and talk a bit about um, the U.S. versus international. And the backdrop here, I think, is interesting, Garrett, because in the first couple months of the year, if you look at flows, uh, there was a big we would argue reallocation to value, cyclicality, and also into international. A lot of the big banks calling for international to outperform. I think a lot of that was based on valuations. Uh, are the returns there in international? Because we've certainly seen that uh, recently international hasn't performed as well for reasons we know. Yeah, you know, it seems like every year we start to get uh, a lot of banks uh, putting out those forecasts and putting out the suggestion that you should move into international. And as you mentioned, generally the story has to do uh, with valuations. But uh, funny, you haven't really seen that play out, and the U.S. continues to generally lead here. Uh, you know, I think the, the issue for us, we continue to favor the U.S., but it might be a story of two halves, right? And that's kind of how we were visioning it uh, coming into the year. And in the first half, favoring the U.S. and specifically favoring quality because, you know, one of the issues was a lot of this volatility driven by uncertainty and the inflation backdrop and the Fed, really two key sources of that. We got another one thrown on in terms of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and I think that continues to be the case. But when you start to think about what really gets that international trade going and specifically, you know, what gets the European trade going, it's going to be a real sustained pickup and synchronization in global growth. And I think what you've seen play out over the last you know, couple of weeks here since the conflict have erupted uh, is these lines here you're looking at in this chart are simply the growth forecast revisions for uh, growth estimates, economic growth estimates across these major economies. And you'll notice that one really does not look like the others. Uh, you're seeing that global EM growth and especially euro area down here at the bottom uh, really lagging behind what you've seen out of the U.S. The U.S. is far closer to recovering back to essentially pre-crisis levels, whereas the remainder of the globe is still kind of mired at lower levels. And you've seen what the impact is of that uncertainty with respect to uh, the current conflict in Ukraine is a sharp downgrade lower for European growth. So I think that continues to be a, a narrative in the short run here. What could flip that? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit of a, a catch-up rally here in the short term, just because of how bearish sentiment is on a global basis. And especially when you start looking at positioning in Europe, uh, we've seen two straight weeks of record outflows. So about six and a half billion two weeks ago coming out of European equities. We shattered that uh, just last week with about another 13 and a half billion. So 20 billion of outflows in just two weeks out of European equities. Probably could see if you start to get a little positive headlines uh, moving towards a resolution, a little bit of a catch-up rally here. Uh, but I think the story still favors leaning into the U.S. in the first half because we're still going to be dealing with a lot of these inflation and, and policy uncertainties. The back half of the year is where you might start to see growth picking up. And think about COVID. That's still an issue abroad, especially what we're seeing out of China. You really do need to get that Asian and EM growth story picking up. Because the European economies are very levered to that global trade backdrop, especially in China. So uh, I think it's kind of a narrative for the back half this year where you may see potential for that Europe trade and international developed trade to get a little bit of runway to it. Uh, but I think right now it's still too early. U.S. and quality, I think, continues to lead. That's great, Garrett. Thanks. So let's quickly go to our last part of, of, of this question, and that's for you, Jack, on just your outlook for emerging markets. It seems like there could be some winners and some losers within within those markets. Yeah, uh, what do you see as potential opportunities? 
Yeah, and this is interesting because it's not really a one size fits all for EM. And if if anything, I, I would at least make the case that um, if you're going to want to take a stab at emerging market equities, the biggest takeaway for me is simply probably do want to go active in this space. So I think that's a key takeaway. You need that sort of uh, picking and choosing by the active managers. And I think that can make a real difference in terms of how we view the emerging market backdrop. But all I simply did here is I pulled the last three months returns. And I think what's interesting, if we start on the far right, just looking at spot FX returns, it tells basically the story you'd expect, right? Any sort of currency or country that's near proximity to uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict saw weakness. Those the furthest away tend to do all right. And even more so, and the byproduct of what we see in the Russia-Ukraine is the commodity price spike. And that's that terms of trade, it's also being a driver here. So, you know, that positive terms of trade shock, you're going to see currency strength. And then the negative terms of trade shock, obviously, um, you're going to see that uh, reflected negatively in the currency. So, again, I think you're seeing winners and losers emerging. A lot of that has to do with the commodity front and your location from a regional perspective relative to the uh, sort of point zero here, ground zero with Russia and Ukraine. And you're also seeing that again in the equity returns, right? Latin America, uh, a pretty strong commodity player, uh, has been holding up fairly well. Um, EMEA and Asia, sort of a little bit of weakness. And then obviously Eastern Europe, and uh, some of that's going to be a function of Russia there, but really falling off hard. Again, not one size fits all. I think you've got to be very selective in terms of your emerging market backdrop. But one of the things I think that's worth highlighting and talking about real quick, a lot of people were really making a big, uh, big deal over what's going on in China. We've heard a lot of talk about it being uninvestable. You know, we've had the risk of uh, Western sanctions kicking in because Russia is basically asking China for some military support. You've had the COVID issues there with some of the lockdowns more recently, their zero tolerance policy. Um, you've also had some regulatory issues with the SEC cracking down on filings, um, ESG concerns. You know, are you going to be owning stocks that are basically doing the bidding of the of Beijing? Um, and some also on the policy front, right? A lot of people expecting some easing going forward. Really haven't had that. The bottom line is a lot of reasons why people have flipped quite negative on that China backdrop. And when you start thinking about what's maybe discounted at current levels, there's some pretty bad news that's already baked in. Let's take the other side of this, right? What are we seeing? Well, we're seeing some signs that the economy may actually be getting a little bit traction in here. And there's quite a bit of negativity, again, priced in. So think about it, where we are versus where we could go. The real estate market's looking a little bit better in here, right? We're starting to see the property market, the property sales starting to pick back up. So that's cash to the developers. That's a good sign. On the back of that, as the property market does a little bit better, mortgage lending would start to pick up. We're seeing some signs of that. Uh, infrastructure spending starting to pick back up again. I know China's been loath to do that. They're saving a little bit of it on that front. If you look at the most recent numbers there, it's up 8.6% on a year-on-year -year basis versus back in December of 3.7 and fixed asset investment picking up. The bottom line, you know, some of the areas that have seen slowdowns, we're starting to see a shift. The construction stats showing strength, the property market sector showing some strength. For all of this together, maybe we're seeing a bottoming in Chinese growth. Maybe this is the time to start thinking about it. As goes China, so goes emerging. And again, it's a little bit challenging because of the Russia-Ukraine story. But if you sort of pick some of those portions on a regional basis and go through an active manager, there's probably some value in some of these emerging market countries at these levels. So something to think about on that front as well. I like that. Thank you, Jack. I like that part about an active manager too. We have some of those in, within our complex. Uh, so uh, we'll go quickly to some of the Q&A here. We've only got a few uh, minutes left. We did start two minutes after. So uh, we'll, we'll try to take one or two here, just looking over in the Q&A box. Uh, not surprising we're getting this question. I guess it's a jump ball for whoever wants to take it. Uh, when do we start to look towards growth over value again, and specifically technology, which uh, have both really taken it on the chin year to date? Yeah, you know, I think that's a question a lot of people have been asking, and I think this year so far, it's really been a story of derating those highest multiple uh, sectors in the market, and that really fits the bill with tech. Um, to be honest, I think the narrative has been higher rates means, you know, a higher discount rate, and you should slash all those companies. I think that's too simplistic, especially when you start looking at the tech complex and the large cap, uh, large cap tech. You know, it's not the discount rate that drives the valuations here, if that's what you think really matters. It's actually the rate of growth, and I think you're you're going to continue to see that these big tech names still generating revenue growth, you know, on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Now, start to put that together with the the prevailing narratives in the marketplace, and obviously, I think we're going to continue to hear some concerns on stagflation, slowing growth. I mean, the the downgrades you saw just from the Fed's projections see slowing growth. 
as you move further into this recovery, growth nat naturally closes, uh, slows, and you probably start to see investors bidding up what's scarce, and that's going to be bidding up growth. So I think it's probably two catalysts here. One, a lot of these names are just so oversold and sentiment's so dire that it's not going to take much to start getting a reversal. And you've seen tech start to lead over the last couple of days here. And then as you look more forward, you know, I think it probably argues that slowing growth is you're going to start to see that uh, dynamic come back into place where investors are bidding up what's scarce and that's growth in tech. Great. Thanks, Garrett. One one more question before we go. Um, that that stagflation, I think, stood out to someone. Uh, if we do get stagflation, what do you do? How do you invest? Maybe I'll 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 direct that one at Jack. Yeah, and that's a tricky one, right? Because uh, I think for the, the average portfolio manager at this point, you've never really uh, a managed to rise the rates on a consistent basis, and b inflationary uh, backdrop. So those are going to be, I think, very interesting times. You know, and the obvious answer is going to real assets. You probably are going to want to start uh, decreasing risk across the board. Um, so, you know, cash as an alternative, which might be a little bit of a trick simply because that nominal value is not going to hold if inflation is pushing up. But, um, you know, the flip side to that, it's going to come back down to hard assets. And so hard assets and then to a lesser extent, you might also want to start thinking about some of the uh, alternative space um, where you can start maybe taking advantage of these non-traditional buckets, if you will. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if something like a managed future would start to show some, uh, some signs of life in there. Um, given that it has the ability to go a short and then b get into some of these asset classes and uh, you know be a little bit more tactful. So you know again hard assets maybe that liquid alt space managed futures uh, that could very well end up being your um, you know your solution in the interim if that's the backdrop that starts to play itself out. Great, thanks, Jack. Well, we're at one fifty nine here. I'll give you guys each maybe thirty seconds. Any final thoughts you want to share with the group? Go ahead, yeah, I'll kick off. I think the, the key for us, you know, listen, we're not in the stagflation camp, although, listen, we'll acknowledge the idea that the odds of, our, of that are certainly increasing. Um, but the flip side to that, I think there's a lot of bad news that's already priced in, and that's the one thing we harp on. You know, we can certainly say that, you know, the, the Fed is going to be hiking, but again, what's already discounted in rate markets, you know, that's, I think, very important too as well. So the incremental moves of, above and beyond that are what matter. There's quite a bit of negativity already discounted in. By the way, if I told you, you know, the equities were only down 9% or so, given the backdrop we've been talking about, I'd say that's holding up pretty well. I think that says a lot. Thanks, yeah. Jack. Anything from you, Garrett? I'll just say, you know, I think that sums it up really well. And, and to kind of harken back to a famous phrase, irrational um, uh, euphoria, you know, kind of feels like right now it's irrational pessimism, to be honest. You know, there's a lot of negativity out there. Sentiment flows across the spectrum seem a little bit divorced from what the realities are out there. Uh, and to be honest, I think that sets us up uh, with a pretty decent skew to the upside. Don't be surprised to see some more volatility here, but I don't think things are quite as dire as a lot of these uh, sentiment indicators suggest. Peak pessimism, right, Garrett? There you appreciate go. Another peak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I, I, we, we appreciate everyone's time and joining us today. Everyone stuck with us. I can tell based on the participants. Uh, we hope that uh, you enjoyed the conversation here today. Just a couple of things. Uh, one, if you'd like to hear inform, uh, more information from these guys, we're regularly publishing their insights. Uh, just hook up with your Natixa salesperson and they can uh, get you signed up with some of the, the newsletters, the dashboards, and uh, the macro updates that come out from these guys on a regular basis. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions after the call, please reach out to us and um, we're happy to uh, entertain any of those. And we appreciate you joining us. We'll do these on a regular basis. It's looking like quarterly at this point. Um, so we appreciate your time again and uh, have a great day. Thank you.